So now let's briefly discuss the other three steps to prove the theorem. In step two, the claim is that F, the image of the open neighborhood um, around C, is open in Rn. And to tackle this theorem, it helps to draw a picture. So what we're going to do is we're going to draw the neighborhood around C. And again, we can assume that since the domain of the function A is open, we can assume that this epsilon is small enough so that this is completely contained inside of, inside of A. So here's epsilon. And the closure of this ball includes this boundary as well. And it's important to note that the boundary included gives us a compact subset of Rn. So this boundary we denote by V epsilon, um, the boundary of this unit ball. And if we look at the image of this domain under the function f, then f of c gets sent to some point, and the boundary gets sent to some, uh, some subset of Rn as well. I don't know what it looks like. It, it might look a little bit complicated. In the case where we're dealing with a two-dimensional ball, then the boundary is a unit circle, and by continuity, I know that this unit circle has to close in on itself. So it looks something like this, and this is a pretty generic picture. Now, here's where we use an interesting fact um, from the previous statement. So the previous step, we knew that this function was one-to-one. -one. And as a result, if I take any point on the boundary, then I know that any point on the boundary, the image is going to be disjoint from f of c, no matter which point on the boundary I pick. And the reason is because if it were to be f of c, then this would violate the fact that it's one-to-one, -one, since I can take the difference. Here it's positive, but here it's not. And in that inequality, we knew that that was a contradiction. So we know that the image of the boundary, the image of the boundary of this epsilon neighborhood, is disjoint from the set containing just a single point, Fc. And one of the exercises in the notes says that if you have a compact set, or in particular two compact subsets, then the distance between these two compact subsets is always strictly positive. Since F, since the image of this boundary is compact, The distance between them is strictly positive. So it's greater than, and it's convenient to, for the proof of this theorem, to choose delta to be, um, to choose this inequality to be, to be twice delta. For some strictly positive, delta greater than zero. So we know that this is true. And what we need to do now is, by the way, this means, so in this picture, this delta maybe looks something like this. So here's two delta. And what we need to do is we need to show that this image, that this entire domain is open. And in particular, what we want to show, so that means we want to find like an open neighborhood or an open rectangle or something like that around every point. So if we cut this in half and we look at the open ball of radius delta around f of c, then from this, the goal now is to show that there exists an open ball 
around the point f of c of radius delta that is contained inside the image of f of this domain. So the goal and that we'll show is the delta neighborhood around f of c is contained in the image of f of this domain. And actually when I say will show, um, I, I won't show this now. Um, the proof is a little bit involved and I want to leave some space for the last two steps of the theorem. So I'll leave you to the notes to look at the proof of the second part of step two. So instead, let's go to step three. And by the way, this shows that it's open. Um, I could have chosen an arbitrary point, right? If I chose, right, let's make sure we understand this. If I chose another point somewhere over here, then I can find an open set around this. And now the center is some new C prime. And then again, I could look at the image and I can do the same exact proof. Um, so it suffices to consider this, the case where we just look at the point C. So let's get back to the other statement, um, the other steps. So step three, we wanted to show that the inverse function is continuous. Now this actually follows from the previous step for the following reason. And the other alternative definition of what it means for function to be continuous. So if we set, um, if let's say W is open in this domain here, then what we want to do is we want to look at the inverse image of this open domain under G. Then G inverse of this open set V better be open. And if it's open, then we've proven what we want to prove, namely that G is continuous. Now this, because f is 1 to 1, is equal to f of v. And remember, v is an open set somewhere in here, so maybe it looks something like, maybe it looks something like this. And from step 2, since f is 1 to 1 and the image of this is open, the same is true of any open subset. So this means that f of v is open by step 2. And that actually concludes step 3, because we've shown that for any open set in this domain, the inverse image is open in this domain, in Rn. So that shows that g is continuous on its domain and we make the domain equal to the image of this open disk around C. And step four, which is the final step, is to prove that G is differentiable at F of C. And I won't indicate the entire proof, but I'll give you an idea of what you should try to do before you read the proof. If G is differentiable at C, imagine we knew that it was, a necessary condition is that its derivative, its differential, is given by the, the inverse of the differential of F at C. So we can set, and it's not yet true that this, we don't yet know that this differential satisfies the properties of a differential of G, but we can set this expression, this linear transformation, to be the inverse of the linear transformation associated to the derivative of F at C. And all that's left in the proof is to show that this expression satisfies the limiting condition in the definition of a differential. And so the goal afterwards is to prove that the limit as h approaches 0 of g of f 
of C plus H minus G of F of C minus this candidate for the differential. So let's plug that in. DCF inverse at the vector H all divided by H and take its magnitude, of course. Sorry, it's, uh, its norm. And we have to show that this expression equals zero. Once we've done this, we've shown that our candidate for the differential satisfies the appropriate definition to show that g is differentiable with differential given by the inverse of the differential of f at c. And now that you have the idea of what the goal of the proof is, it might be easier to read the proof.